Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. Today we're going to be speaking about the rights of college athletes. And we have two guests today. Uh, we have Cassandra Ramsey, who is a, uh, an attorney who has also written a, an e-booklet about the rights of college athletes, but particularly their name, likeness, and image. And then we have Mason Ash, who is a sports and entertainment attorney. And welcome to both of you. Glad to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Well, uh, maybe we start with you, Mason. What is going on with college is right now in terms of name and likeness and, and, and the rights of college athletes? Well, the biggest thing, I believe, is that uh, we're getting to have a real attack on amateurism. For so many years, athletes were not able to make money. Student athletes were not allowed to make money um, from their playing the sport or their name, image, or likeness. And so the biggest difference now is that we've carved out the NIL, the name, image, and likeness, and we still can't allow them, or they're still not allowed to make money for playing the sport, but they are now allowed to uh, do a deal with a third party that will pay them basically marketing. Um, and so, you know, and I teach this class, sports law, I usually say there's three buckets of revenue. You know, you have your first bu bucket with uh, an employer, the second bucket is endorsements. The third bucket is your intellectual property rights. So athletes now, all of a sudden, they don't get compensation for playing, but they do get now an ability to get paid for endorsements and product endorsements and appearances and that sort of thing, basically uh, using their name, image, and likeness. And then the next step is going to be what type of intellectual property rights they can you know, file trademarks and come up with all sorts of logos, and that's going to be the next frontier. But what about, and maybe I'll ask, throw this to both of you, what about athletes that aren't big name athletes? Are, how are they going to monetize their name and, and image and likeness? One of the biggest opportunities for college athletes with these new NIL rights would be marketing via social media. Um, even if it may not be a big name athlete on the national stage, that athlete could still have quite a following on social media where certain companies will wish to have that athlete endorse their products via social media. And they would make money, and right now they can't do it, but you hope that they would be able to do it. So with the name, image, and likeness rights, they should be able to garner endorsement deals from a third-party company, as um, Mason stated, to um, schedule posts on their social media platforms, and then they will be paid for their posting. But what I'm trying to understand, and maybe I didn't understand this completely, is they cannot, uh, an athlete cannot do this now? Prior to being given name, image, and likeness rights, no. Um, one of the best examples, the more recent examples, would be with a kicker from the University of Central Florida. Um, I believe his name was Donald De La Haye. He created a YouTube channel where he was just simply showing a day in his life. And part of his life was playing football, being that he was a kicker for the football team. And once the NCAA and the university found out that he was monetizing that channel, they made him decide between continuing his college football career or monetizing his YouTube channel. Wow. So, so in that particular case, that student is forced to decide whether he's really an athlete or a student. He's forced to decide if he wants to continue to play football under the stringent amateurism rules or just continue to do what he was doing, what many, what, 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 what many college students do, whether they're athletes or not, which is just simply film their life and post it on YouTube and just kind of have like a, a, a video blog showing their life. But he's got so many um, followers and such a following that he was able to monetize that opportunity. And so what, if, if a university representative was here, what would they say right now? What, what would they say, let's say they were from Florida and they were representing the university, what would they say about that student? I think they would say that they, well, they, they, they would have to be, um, I guess, on the side of the NCAA because the universities are, you know, the NCAA's members. So, and they've ag agreed to follow the NCAA's rules and the NCAA's rules prohibit um, college athletes from making any money that's related to their athletic ability or athletic rep reputation. Another example is, for instance, when um, one of the current big-time running backs in the NFL, you know, his family used to uh, basically uh, make T-shirts, you know, and, and be, during his college games, you know, and sell them in the parking lot and wear them. And, and basically with marketing, this particular, you know, um, idea and slogan and name that they came up with, 
and they were shut down. The school would not let them sell T-shirts in the parking lot because it was, as you said, capitalizing on the player, the student athlete's uh, sports career at the school, and that is not allowed. So student athletes cannot make money uh, when it is leveraging their, uh, their athletic ability at that school. You know, they're just not allowed to do it. So now, all of a sudden, you know, this will be some type of a, I guess, a departure from their strict amateurism because amateur athletes play for the love of the game, not for money. And anything that is a derivative of the game is still a violation of amateurism. Now, all of a sudden, because the states have, have said, five states have said, you know, come this summer, we're going to let our student athletes uh, make money and we're going to make prohibit any university in our state from stopping a player or his family from marketing his name, image and likeness, which he, he owns. But this is the first time a state is actually overruling the NCAA. So then if I was a student athlete and I really uh, had a big following, I might want to go to one of those five a states. Absolutely. Now, that's the biggest problem right now. So the other 45 states are saying, wait a minute. So either we have to pass laws in our state too, otherwise we're gonna lose some of the best players because the bigger schools in the other five states who are allowing them to come there and be a student athlete, get a full scholarship, plus make money off the field, that's a huge disadvantage to the other 45 states. And that's where all the stress and pressure is right now. And last week in Congress, when they had a big hearing still, trying to convince Congress to pass a national law, as opposed to letting individual states carve out different benefits so that basically college uh, student athletes and their families would be shopping for the best benefit package in a particular state because the laws may be a little bit different. But I, I, I guess if you don't mind me pressing on this point a little bit, I mean, if I was representing a high school student as a mom or a dad or an advisor, why wouldn't I want my student to get the best possible deal? No, you would, but you would. But previously, everybody was similarly situated. 50 states had the same ban on making any extra money. So you would shop to get the best scholarship, perhaps, right? And the best education combined and bundled with, this, with the athletic ability to perhaps, if that player had the potential of going professional, then you would go to the best program that would give that player the best stage to basically interview with the professional league that they hope to ascend to afterwards, along with getting an education, right? But now there's another prong in the mix. You can come here and in case you don't go professional, here's an opportunity for you as a student athlete to actually make money now because there are some big time college athletes who are phenomenal college athletes, and, but they don't make it to the pros. And so this is their time to shine now. And so now they have a chance to actually cash in where they never had the opportunity before. What about somebody who does something completely unrelated, who he's a musician, and he happens to be an athlete, but he's also a musician. So can that person under the current rules sell CDs, sell streaming rights to their songs? Are they prohibited from a doing A musician that? is not a student athlete, so there's no conflict. A student athlete rule from the NCAA is talking about the sport that you're playing that is being regulated by the NCAA rule. NCAA has no jurisdiction over a musician. But what about another athlete? Let's say I play football and like I happen to play golf as well. Well, it all depends on if, if your team that you're playing on is being regulated by that NCAA rule. Now, there may be a situation where the school doesn't even have a golf team, right? But you can't play professional. You could play professional, a different sport. Like you, I guess if you were a golfer, a professional golfer, but then you played amateur baseball. I mean, you could do that. I mean, but the sport that you are supposedly being regulated for, you cannot make money from while you're in school. But we've even seen issues where there were Olympic athletes who played their Olympic sports and had opportunities to get endorsements and had to make decisions between um, receiving that compensation for their Olympic sports and playing, say, football. Um, the case with um, Jeremy Bloom, which is a pretty popular case that a lot of people um, know, know about, where he was um, playing an Olympic sport and it came uh, to, to head where he had to choose between the benefits he was receiving from that and the restrictions that he had playing college football. So now with the name, image, and likeness abilities, ho hopefully, you know, student athletes won't be, or college athletes, excuse me, won't, won't be um, faced with those type of d decisions. In terms of the people that, the advocacy the work that you're doing, so what advocacy am I missing? So what, what are you, what, what's the next step in terms of where, what we're gonna try to advocate for or what you're gonna try to advocate for for, uh, for student athletes? 
Um, I believe the next step is really going to come with health and safety. Um, at the hearing um, last week that my colleague mentioned, um, Senator Booker um, has introduced the college athletes name image, um, college athlete bill of, bill of rights. And an important part of that is putting health and safety measures in for college athletes so that if they are injured while playing, they still have long term medical insurance so that they don't leave school with debilitating career in the industries and no way in injuries and no way to um, get help for those injuries. Another reason why I think health and safety will be next is during the pandemic, we were faced with how, how do we or do we bring college football players back to start the season um, in the midst of the pandemic? Well, we all know that they did come back, but during that time we had several schools, um, namely o Ohio State comes to mind, that was asking their players to sign liability waivers, basically saying that if they contracted COVID-19 that they that, that Ohio State would not be liable. Um, they, you know, some things came out after that and the question of whether or not they would enforce those waivers, you know, was kind of like, well, they probably wouldn't, but they still was asking athletes to sign them and pretty much with no representation, the athletes were being asked to sign them. So with that, health, health and safety is a major topic that I think is going to come up next. Let's say I had a student who wanted to go to Ohio State and went to Ohio State and got a scholarship and they got hurt and then they could end up in a worse position than they were before, if I understood what you were saying. I mean, if you suffer a debilitating injury, yes, you could. And then even um, here at the University of Maryland a few years ago, they had a football player lose his life um, due to football related activities. Um, so health and safety is, is a major area that is going to be covered next. And to, to press on this a little bit, who, who advocates for the students? I imagine the, the NCAA advocates for the universities and the universities advocate for the NCAA. But who advocates for the student athletes, the high school kids who are going to go to Ohio State or the University of Maryland or Hamilton or any other college? So that's actually a very good question. And it's you know a little unclear. There are some organizations that advocate for the students. There's like a, a national organization that was started to advocate for college players' rights, but college athletes do not have a union. Um, back in 2014, some football players at Northwestern University tried to form a union, but the National Labor Relations Board denied their petition. Most recently, we've had, um, I think, Senators Chris Murphy and Bernie Sanders introduced the College Athlete Right to Organize Act, which seeks to amend the National Labor Relations Act to include college athletes as, as employees so that they can form some kind of entity to represent their interests. But as of right now, there's no really formal, strong entity that represents college athletes' in, um, um, interests in the same way that the NFL and the NBA has a players association. Mason, do you have something else to, to add to well, that? Well, I would say, you know, that what you're touching on is a bigger issue in the sense that for years, everybody has argued that the actual uh, letter of intent contract that family sign uh, or player sign with the endorsement of their parents, uh, they really uh, are not equally, I guess, positioned to really negotiate. A lot of times the families are first time uh, signing a deal like that. Um, they want the scholarship. They may not understand all the deals and all the related uh, terms involved. Sometimes the scholarship is a one year scholarship, not a four year scholarship, uh, or they are or four separate one year type of things. And there's all kinds of stipulations from a grade point average or from a performance standpoint that may uh, have to happen in order for the second year or the third year or the fourth year to be valid. Sometimes people don't read that and they're not getting sometimes the advice. But for years and years and years, uh, it's been seen as that particular engagement, that arm's length deal is not necessarily fair for the student athlete because they don't often have lawyers or they don't have a family advisor. And the university, of course, is coming and, and, and dangling this educational and, and performance opportunity to play, especially if this player thinks they want to go pro. They may not even think about, OK, well, in case I don't play and I get cut, will I still be able to get my education? But what could, he, what could a student do to protect themselves? Well, you can get counsel, first of all, in the beginning, but there is no union, like she said. You know, so they're basically, uh, and, and it's such a wide range of deals that are being offered, right? But, but the NCAA is supposed to be that sort of watchdog, right? That's supposed to be that regulating body to make sure that the playing field is fair for everybody involved. Although, of course, now some people believe that uh, they may be 
conflicted a little bit because they are also the, the benefactor of this big money machine that's being created. But they are really in position to govern. And that's when we talk about governing sports, the NCAA is a governing body. And the whole point is to make sure that it, it runs almost like the league office does in the professional ranks, right? The league office is making sure that the owners of the teams get along and the system works so that the, the sport itself is for the the betterment of the game, you know, both the game is going to be competitive, it's going to be balanced, and the and the people that are involved, the stakeholders, have some kind of fairness involved. Well, that's kind of what the NCAA is like the league office. And you and you and they are kind of balancing the interests of the presidents of the universities, but they also have to look out for the students' best interests. And unfortunately, some people believe that the students need a union of some sort to be able to help keep everything balanced, but that doesn't exist. What if a student athlete was a climate denier or they had these really crazy political ideas and those crazy political ideas embarrassed the university? Would the university have some mechanism to make sure that the university's uh, reputation wasn't tainted by that student athlete? That's a contract basis, right? The, net, the, the, the letter of intent is the contract that governs that entire relationship. And within that contract, just like any other professional contract or a, pro a professional services contract, and I know this is not supposed to be professional because they, they're not really uh, playing for money, they're playing for a scholarship and, and the benefit of an education. But that contract outlines everything that needs to basically be monitored and negotiated between that relationship, between the player and the university. The letter of intent tells it all. And, and, and then there's obviously addendums to it as far as what the scholarship is going to look like and what the cost of education is now, because that's the new nuance now is, is it just education and books or is it the cost of education? Is it also now you get trips back home, you get all these other little things that they add in that you may need, tutoring or whatever other expenses you might need. Um, but the bottom line is that letter of intent is the contract and in that would tell you basically the rights of both parties and the university's rights are out outlined there almost like a moral conduct clause if, if, if the student is doing things that is going to bring a negative light on the school then they can void this contract based on the fact of the student breaching the contract. So I might have a different contract with student athlete X versus student athlete Y. Well it's, it's supposed to be sort of a boilerplate sort of thing you know but the letter of intent I don't know that's the same exact letter of intent that's being signed at Alabama that you would see at Hamilton or that you would see at, well actually there's no letter of intent at Hamilton, but you figure another Division I program, I don't know if, if uh, Cal Berkeley and Alabama and Georgetown have it exactly the same, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but you would think that there's some sort of a, a boilerplate agreed upon sort of terms that are general. But, you know, it'd be an interesting study, you know, to see whether or not they're exactly the same. But, but whatever the relationship is, that's where you go to find out what is the rights of the player, what's the right of the, of the university, basically, when they engage each other. But a lot of this seems to me to be also an economic issue. So if you have a kid, let's say, from a poor family from somewhere and you say, well, you're going to get a scholarship for X amount of dollars, that may be you know, worth its weight in gold to that family. But to that university, that might not be that much money. And so maybe depending on how competitive that student is relative to how powerful that school is, that could affect what's in those letters of intent. Yeah, perhaps. But I mean, it's the same. You know, the, the school is coming to a player to make the team, help them, you know, win games, you know, and that sort of thing. But again, of course, all of this is supposed to be for the love of the game. You're, you're, you described it as almost as a professional kind of a scenario where the school is trying to find the best athletes in state, out of state, to come in and play, put on a, a, a program that's all part of the educational process. That's what the purpose of sports is supposedly at a university. It's not uh, a, a commercial entity, supposedly, right? This is all for the educational process and, the, and all of the joy that brings back alumni on campus and the students get together and it's all part of this whole educational process. Not necessarily, uh, let's go get a player to come and increase our commercial uh, you know, entity here, uh, but that is what happens, of course. But it seems that that, that, that fine line isn't so fine. It's really not so fine, and that's one of the things that is being challenged right now um, before the United States Supreme Court. The, the points that my colleague just, just made was actually one of the cornerstones of the NCAA's arguments in the case. Just for a brief background, a former football player, Sean Austin, sued the NCAA and several of his conferences, alleging that 
their amateurism rules violated federal antitrust law. At the lower level and at the um, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, affirmed the, lower, the district court's d decision that the NCAA's rules do in fact violate antitrust law, but that their rules are necessary to uphold amateurism, but that there is a less restrictive way that the NCAA can uphold amateurism. And that less restrictive way is for the NCAA to continue to restrict non-education related benefits, but no longer be able to restrict education related benefits. And the NCAA contends that their rules are necessary to do just some of the things that my colleagues were just describing, which is to keep the educational value in college sports and to maintain that distinction between professional sports and college sports. And what is that distinction? Well, that the athletes in college are not paid and that fans love college sports because the athletes in college are not paid. So um, back at the end of March, the Supreme Court heard um, or, or arguments on this case. So any moment now, the um, Supreme Court could issue its, its ruling. Um, while it won't have a, it's not likely to have a tremendous effect on name, image, and likeness per se, as you know, name, image, and likeness is going to come a lot from third parties. It will, you know, has potential to have a tremendous effect on the future of college athletics. But you mentioned before that that was first of all, thank you. That was interesting. But how would you make the case ethically that the basketball players at the University of Kentucky, who are only there for a year, are actually seriously engaged in the in the academic enterprise at Kentucky? Well, let's look at why they're only there for a year. That's because the NBA has was has become known as the one and done rule. You know, prior to that, um, athletes could go straight to the NBA. Look at LeBron James, um, Kobe Bryant. They all went straight to to the NBA. So college basketball and college football, although some may not want to acknowledge it. So it, it does serve as sort of a minor league for the NBA and the NFL. So as of now, the only viable option that they've had have been to go to college. But we've also seen trends now where we've had more um, high profile basketball prospects go to play over overseas professionally to the National Basketball League. We had R RJ Hampton go a couple of years ago. We had LaMelo Ball go. And we have several other startup leagues coming up. Um, Overtime Sports is creating a league for high school basketball players. We have the Professional Collegiate League that's creating a league for college basketball players and they intend to pay the players and provide an alternative um, path uh, to, to, to college sports. Wow. That's really, this well, is fascinating. College basketball, at least. College football so far still really only have co college football. I mean, it, for, for, to make it to professional football, right now your most viable option is college football. So where's all the money going? So if, if, if the big name football and basketball programs are, going, are, are, are running, where's the money flowing from where to where? Because it seems to me the most the kids are getting are their co scholarships unless they can do the name, images, and likeness. Right. So, you know, the money goes to the conferences and it goes to the schools and some goes back to the NCAA or organization. Um, from a fan perspective and everything, just in general looking at the system's perspective, we see these lavish, lavish facilities coming up on these college campuses where, you know, we have like barbershops and music studios and everything inside the football and basketball facilities at the different universities that are largely used as recruiting tools. Like, hey, look, you come and play here, you'll be able to have access to, to this facility and, and everything. So that's largely where a lot of the money is going. We have um, college basketball coaches, football coaches who are oftentimes the highest in paid employees in, in the state, <laughs> you know, so, you know, signing nine, ten million dollar contracts. Well, another interesting point about where the money goes, for instance, even with NILs. So the question is, you know, should universities have any involvement in the national uh, or the name, image and likeness for student athletes? Or can they do that totally separate outside of the school system since it's a third party they're going to? Should the schools be able to set up and arrange these deals for the student athlete or and if they do, do they get a fee? You know, so we talk about where the money goes. It's interesting. There's an argument that says, well, if the school sets it up, maybe they should get a slice of the pie. You know, <laughs> like, are you serious? Wait a minute. You, they take most of the pie already, as it is, right? So now you're saying, and they should also have the ability to regulate and know what the players, some players are saying, the school shouldn't even know what deals they're setting up with third parties because it's not their business. You know, if they're, if they're marketing their own name, image, and likeness, they should be able to do that with an attorney or an agent that they hire, and that should be private information. But 
there are rules that are being, uh, there are some of the proposed laws that are being uh, discussed as to, well, who's going to regulate to keep, make, make sure that's still the safety and, uh, of the player, student athlete is, is uh, in line. So should it be the school that regulates? So does the school, the student athlete have to report to the school the deals that they set up with third parties? And then there's certain, I've seen articles where they said the school may even regulate the, the amount that a player should get because it might be too much and there might be some kind of, uh, you know, misdeed involved somewhere because they're overpaying them for their market value. Well, now, how does the school set the market value for a student athlete? If the student athlete is on social media and millions of followers and very popular and they're able to do some blockbuster deal with a third party, should a school be able to interfere and restrict that and maybe take a cut because they may have introduced them? Now, most of the rules are saying schools cannot introduce the players, cannot arrange those deals, because then you're talking about when they're recruiting, they're saying, well, come over here to our school because we've already had it lined up. You have a $5 million marketing, whatever, you know, and then we talk about these guarantees, you know, that sometimes student athletes get from agents or the agencies that are recruiting them for professional. So will those marketing guarantees be prevalent? Well, the student athlete now have and trying to figure out who's going to help them negotiate and market them. Will they go to an agency that's given them a $5 million marketing advance guarantee, right? And then you're like, wow. So who's going to regulate that? What's too much of an advance? Because now you've got agencies bidding against each other to try to get the right to help a student athlete. You know, so there's a lot of different, when you start talking about where the money's going and who's going to participate and then who, and how much is enough and how much is too much, who makes those decisions? Those things are still being debated. For the general public, what would you advise the general public to do about this? Just to realize that it is a civil rights issue. There's essentially no other... Um, college student that is told um, that they can't make money off of their name, image, and likeness so that they can't monetize their YouTube channel or get paid for a post on social media. But college athletes are just by virtue of the fact that they play a college sport. So it really is a civil rights issue that these people, these athletes, should have the ability to make money off of their own name, image, and likeness. Well, thank you both. This was really an interesting discussion. And as we're talking about this, I, I think we should probably explore more of this on the show because I think this is going to affect more and more student athletes, more and more families. So thank you both for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you. If you would like additional information about higher education today and would like to get in touch with me directly, please send an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.